thanks to the organizers for inviting me here. So when I was invited here to give a talk together with Claude Lebrun, it was somehow clear to me that the best subject would be to talk about the Marble constants and the Marble invariants. And we have results about how they behave under surgeries, the Chrome of Lawson type uh, constructions. And uh, so that's the subject. So many of the results I will present today are rather old results about 10 years ago, but all the results are tightly related to positive scalar culture and there are many developments in positive scalar culture. And many things we did at that time also transfer to other kind of type of results. And therefore I also checked in the, uh, some, some months ago, how much uh, the techniques also generalize to other things. So there will also be some new things which are still work in progress uh, that I will talk about. So the guest things are uh, joint work with Emmanuel and Bear, Matthias Dahl, and there's work by Nadine Kose, who goes, which goes implicitly into it here. And then there's also a project with uh, my former postdoc, Nobu Otoba. Yeah. So <clears throat> the basic thing we talk, we'll talk about is, an, is the Yamabe constant and Yamabe invariant, and they are defined by the Einstein Hilbert functional. So the setting is that we have a uh, compact manifold, and my manifolds are always without boundary. Uh, and the dimension of the manifold should be at least three. And R of M shall denote the space of our Riemannian matrix on M. And then we define the renormalized Einstein Hilbert functional as follows. So we take the, for metric G, we take the scalar culture, and then we integrate it with respect to the Riemannian volume element over M. And so this quantity is not scaling invariant if the dimension is larger than two. Uh, so we divide it by a certain power of the volume of G, of MG, and the power is just made in a way such that this whole expression is scaling invariant. So we have good chances to find uh, critical points. So, and what we do now, we also need the conformal class. So the, everybody knows that the conformal class of a metric G0 are all the metrics which arise by multiplying with a positive smooth function. And this positive smooth function will always be written in that form with this exponent four divided by n minus two, and n is the dimension of the manifold, and it's very convenient for the other problem and related issues. Yeah, <clears throat> so then if we look at the einstein hilbert function and we, and we view it as a function on the space of, of in a conformal class, then the, then the stationary points, they are just metrics of constant scalar culture, but if you view it as a, as a functional on the space of all, on all metrics, then the stationary points are Einstein metrics. So Yamada's idea was to, to use a min-max procedure in order to find Einstein metrics on a given manifold M. But then this program to some extent worked fine and to some extent it failed. Yeah, but this, yeah. So the first step in Yamada's program was to minimize this Einstein Hilbert functional in a fixed conformal class. So in this infimum over this over the einstein hill function in such a conformal class, that's the so-called Yamabe constant. And because it's a conformal invariant, I also will call it the conformal Yamabe constant. So and I use these two notations, sometimes the first one, sometimes the second one. And it's easy to show that this infimum is actually a real number. So it's larger than minus infinity. And there is an easy blow up argument which shows that the Amabe constant is always bounded above by the value of the Amabe constant of the round sphere. So Sn with the, with the double bar is always the round sphere. And if you now if you have an arbitrary manifold, then you always can blow up a point conformally and you can make the sphere larger and larger and larger. And then in the limit, that only the sphere will remain and this, this manifold somehow, the, the contribution of this remaining manifold doesn't play any role anymore. And so you easily can show that the Amabe constant of an arbitrary manifold is always bounded from above by the Amabe constant of the round sphere. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> so the Amabe problem asks whether the infimum is actually attained. And uh, that's, the, that's this pr famous problem was then solved by by many articles in a more and more generality by Trudinger and Aubin. And finally, the final step was done by Rick Shane using the Shane-Yao positive mass theorem 
and this was done around 1984. Yeah, so uh, that's one important remark is that the CMRB constant is positive if and only if this class contains a metric of positive scalar curvature. So the, for example, the minimizer in this function is then a metric of constant positive scalar curvature. And uh, if there is a metric of positive scalar curvature in the class, then the Yamaha constant is positive. Another important remark is if there is a metric of positive scalar curvature in a conformal class, then the space of all such metrics is contractible in that conformal class. So, and this will be important later on. Yeah, if you want to tackle the, if you want to approach the Yamaha problem, then there's important reformulation. So I already said, it's very convenient to write the metric G in the form U to this power four divided by N minus two times uh, a background metric G zero metric in a conformal class. So let's for the moment assume that M is compact. So we, one defines the Amabe operator, which is just this constant here times the Laplacian of or G zero plus the scalar curvature. Then you can reformulate the einstein hilbert function in another way. So essentially, if you look here at this operator here, this is then the same thing as the scalar curvature of G with a certain power of u, so it's u n plus two divided by n minus two. So, and, and you also can translate everything. So the whole uh, numerator of this expression, that's just the same thing as before the integral of the scalar code to g, the vol g. That's, and similarly, the, 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 the denominator is also turns then into this LP norm of u. And so you can also uh, try to minimize this quantity and if you minimize this quantity then for a compact manifold, you get that it's the same as the Yamabe constant we just defined. And now if we have a non-compact manifold, we can use this, uh, this, this, this definition here as a definition of the Yamabe constant for a non-compact manifold. That's what we will do. And here we then take compact support. Uh, so about this Yamabe constant of non-compact spaces, there are some work by Aku Dagawa, also worked by Nadine Große and also worked by myself with Nadine Große, which somehow helps to characterize certain invariants I will discuss later on. So it appears implicitly in the talk here. So an important ingredient is also Obata's theorem and Obata's theorem it tells us, so if we have a manifold which is connected and compact and of dimension at least three, and if it carries a met, an Einstein metric G0, and if I also have now a conformally equivalent metric G. So G is uh, this power of U times G zero. And if G also has constant scalar curvature, then, uh, then, then there are two cases, either, either MG zero is conformal to the sphere. And then there are many such solutions. So the conformal group of the sphere gives many such solutions. But if uh, MG zero is not conformal to the sphere, then there is only one possibility, and that's that U is a constant. So the, the Einstein metric is it's in its conformal class up to rescaling the only metric of constant scalar curvature. So, and this has an important consequence because the, the, on a conformal class, the Einstein Hilbert function attains its infimum. Therefore, there is a constant scalar curvature metric in which, in which the the, the, in which the infimum is attained. And therefore this, the, the infimum is attained. So if G0 is an Einstein metric, then the infimum is, is attained in this Einstein metric. And there's a similar other case in which we can make a similar conclusion. So if we have, a, so if M is compact, and if we have a metric of constant scalar curvature, and the constant should be non-positive, then even without the Einstein condition, we have a similar conclusion. So if we, if we replace here this Einstein condition by having constant non-positive scalar curvature, then we have the same conclusion. And that's actually much easier to prove that's just an easier, easy application of the maximum principle. Uh, so in both cases, we can easily characterize the Yamabe constant as the Einstein-Hilbert functional of this 
special metric that we can write, write down explicitly in many cases. So, but in general, uh, as you would note, it's very hard to determine this Yamabe constant. Even this conformal invariant is in, in general very hard to characterize. So, yeah, so um, now everything is back here on the slides. So now I want to talk about surgery. So let me recall surgery is the following operation. So I have an embedding of a sphere together with the trivialization of the normal bundle and then up to homotopy. That's the same thing that if I, that if I have, an, have an, uh, an embedding of a K dimensional sphere uh, with the product with a disk of the complementary dimension into, dimension, into an N dimensional manifold M. And now what we do is we take the image of this embedding or the open, the inner part of this embedding, the, 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 embed, the, the image of the sphere across the inner, the, the open disk, and we remove it. So we remove this the inner of this image, and then we get a manifold with boundary and we clue in then a disk of dimension K plus one across a sphere in a canonical way. And then we say that M sharp arises by K dimensional surgery from M. And these surgeries are tightly connected to bordisms. So we take out such a sphere in this picture, and then we get a manifold with boundary, and then we glue in here two disks in this example, and then we get in this picture a two dimensional sphere out of a torus. So that's the surgery construction. And we are mostly interested in surgeries of co dimension at least three. So the dimension should be small or equal to n minus three. And um, and we have there is a and we have a construction which depends on a certain parameter, and this construction associates to an arbitrary Riemannian metric G on M, uh, Riemannian metric on M sharp, and uh, and this is then similar as the Kolmogorov Larsen construction, and this yields then the following result. So <clears throat> so we. There's a result with, together with Matthias Stahl and Emmanuel Lambert from 2013. So there's a positive constant, and I should say this is not just a small positive cost, constant, that's really um, a positive constant of, of, which is pretty large, all right? And we have explicit lower bounds for this constant. Uh, and I will say more about it later on, such that the Amabe constant after surgery of this new metric, of this chromov Lawson metric, it's larger or equal to the minimum of the Yamabe constant of the metric before the surgery. And this constant up to a small error term and the small error term, it goes to zero if tau goes to infinity. And this can also be done even uh, uniform if you have a family of metrics, which will play an important role. But this goes to zero if tau goes to infinity. So this metric, it's, this, this construction of the metric, as I said, it's similar to the chromov Lawson construction for positive scalar curvature metrics, uh, but somehow the technical, uh, the technical uh, construction is a bit different. Uh, because so, so if you want to check that a metric is has positive scalar curvature, it's a local calculation. But if you want to say something about the Amabe constant, it's a global thing you have to consider, and therefore the arguments are more, more involved. But also these more involved arguments allow certain things, uh, certain other conclusions, which are then almost immediate. So the technical implementation we chose is the following. So think, so let S be the image of this embedded sphere and R the distance to the sphere. And then if we, we can write somehow the metric in Fermi coordinates close to S, so up to lower order terms, the metric then looks as follows. At first, we have the metric induced on this on this submanifold S, and then we have the R squared, where the R comes from the distance to the submanifold, which is then a smooth uh, tensor close to close to S, and then also we have somehow S and polar coordinates R squared times the round metric, and it's the round metric out of the spheres turning around, and then there are lower order terms coming from the second fundamental form from the curvature of the normal bundle and such terms. And, and then, uh, yeah, and that's some other thing. Now, if you do a conformal change by, by multiplying everything by one over R squared, and if you replace now minus logarithm of R by the variable T, 
Then uh, somehow the first term gets into e to the power two t times g, it's the tangential part. And then the dr squared, if I divide it by r squared, it turns into the t squared. And here, this is just an round metric. And now, if we look at, if we draw this as a picture, then this picture somehow this component here to the right, that's the that's the t direction in both pictures. And in the first picture, this shows somehow the the t or so the radial direction, and it also shows the direction in the in the normal direction. That's the normal direction. So it's normal. It's a sphere normal to 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 the to the to S, and this is this is the tangential direction, uh, tangential to S. And if you look at it, and you see that somehow this tangential part it blows up in a very fast way, whereas the the normal direction is gets to a round sphere, and this is also then shown here in this picture somehow schematically. So, so what is this metric finally does? Somehow in the first step it interpolates between the original metric and this blown up metric. That's what happens from here to here. So we have here this so where the, the, the normal sphere have then constant size and the, tangent, the tangential part blows up. And then what one has to do is one has to slow down this very fast growth in the tangential direction. And, and this has to be done in a very slow way, and the drawing doesn't reflect this at all. Uh, somehow we have to achieve there's a, sec there's a second derivatives of the logarithm are very, very small. So if tau is getting to infinity, then this second derivative of the logarithm sh should go to zero. And but it nevertheless can be done. And then we bend it down again, and then we can glue in everything we want essentially, and then we get such a common flaws of construction. So, and for this construction, then you have to show that then the Yamaha constant has the desired behavior. So if there is um, time remaining, I'll uh, say some words how to prove this. Uh, Bernd, may yeah. I ask, uh, I, yeah. I, I have a question. Um, yeah. Is it necessary to assume that the normal bundle is trivial for this construction, the normal bundle to the surgery sphere? Not, not really, it's, uh, it's very flexible. Okay. Yeah. Somehow it's, it is, you only need it at the end in order to clue in this thing here. Sure, yeah. Yeah, there you need or, it. But otherwise you don't, don't really need it. It's a very flexible construction. And also for the generalization, if you look at the proof, then you also have a similar statement. Maybe if the time admits, we come to this at the end. Yeah, so um, that's more or less the, one of the key ideas. And in fact, this, this construction is more, more general. You can also do it in a parametrized version, so we can do it for families of metrics. And therefore, it's interesting now to look at such spaces of metrics where the Yamabe constant is above a certain value lambda. So this space is very special if lambda is equal to zero, because then this is the space of all metrics where the Yamabe constant is positive. Uh, and as we already said, it's the same, same space of conformal classes, or of, this is space of all metrics such that they are conformal to a metric of positive scalar curvature. So the, 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 the Amabe constant is positive, we said, if and only if the conformal class contains a positive scalar curvature metric. So that's the, these are the same things. And now you can show easily that the space of positive scalar curvature metric in such a class is contractible. And therefore this space is homotopy equivalent to the space of positive scalar curvature metrics. And because this space is very well studied, there's a lot of little, lot of literature about a special case of the about the topology of this space if this lambda is equal to zero. And we now look at the space if lambda is a positive number. And then there's a certain range in which it's it behaves very well, and that's the, the interval from zero to this this constant capital capital lambda n k. So um, <clears throat> so. I think I forgot here to say that here I assume that this lambda is bounded by this lambda nk. And then this construction, it gives us a map. Uh, so, so if this m sharp is obtained from m by a k-dimensional surgery, and if you assume, I also forgot to write it down here, that k is smaller or equal to n minus three, then we get such a map from this 
um, say maybe I also, also assume that zero is more equal to lambda. And then we get a well-defined map from the space of all metrics, just that the Amade constant uh, is larger to lambda to the corresponding space on the manifold after surgery. And, and, this, and, and our techniques also allow directly the proof of journalish Walsh type results. Essentially, you can take the same arguments, but you have to arrange them in a bit different way. It's never, we never wrote it up properly, but I started to write it up uh, and all the arguments work through. So our arguments are pretty robust for such deformations. So what we get is we get the following theorem that if the dimension is at least two, then this map is in fact a homotopy equivalence. So somehow if you do the construction in one direction by doing a k-dimensional surgery, so if I go from M to M sharp by a k-dimensional surgery, I can invert the construction by a surgery of dimension N minus k minus one. And if I go back and forward and back and compose the two maps, then this is homotopy equivalent to the identity on all these spaces. Yeah, and also clearly the other way around. Uh, yeah, I want to say some words about this constant lambda nk. So obviously, this number is not unique. So if I were to replace this number here by this number divided by three or four, I, we will still have the same result. So the result is stronger the larger this constant lambda nk is. And this constant for which we've proven the theorem, they can be essentially easily characterized and essentially means here, there are some exceptions. The exceptions arise if the co-dimension is three and the dimension is at least seven, then there are additional programs. Uh, but if you are not in the special case, then you can characterize these constants here as the infimum of these Yamabe constants of these non-compact manifolds here. So these manifolds, they arise by a blow-up construction from our surgery construction, from, from this matrix I wrote down explicitly uh, some slides before. So here we take the standard metric on the sphere and we cross it with a rescaled version of the hyperbolic sphere. So somehow the hyperbolic metric is stretched by a certain parameter, parameter by the parameter one over C. So finally, this is a rescaled version of the hyperbolic spa uh, space such that the sectional curvature is equal to minus C squared and C goes from zero to one. So the curvatures are, the, the, the absolute value of the curvature is bounded by one. And in a special case that C is equal to zero, there's just a flat Euclidean space here. And all these spaces have a positive Yamabe constant. And we can take the infimum over all these Yamabe constants and we get another positive constant. And that's this number lambda nk. So um, it's now convenient for formulations to take the minimum over all these constants. And I also should say, we essentially could also remove the first factor because this is equal, equivalent to the Amabe constant of the round sphere. And, and so this doesn't play any role because it's somewhat the maximum which can be attained anyhow. So this could be, uh, this, this doesn't play a role. So I also said that this number in fact that we get are not very small, what we can show, we can say, we can calculate this, this number lambda nk in very, very few cases. And this, this expression cannot be evaluated, but we can get lower estimates with different kind of techniques. And for example, in four dimension, this minimum is largely equal to 38.9 and the Amabe, well, well, the Amabe constant of the round sphere is 61. So that's, it's, it's obviously smaller, but it's not, by factor 10, it's, it's pretty close, I find. And also for five, we have uh, some of these numbers here. Um, we can calculate in some cases, and there are also two conjectures, which I could explain if time is remaining. Uh, so if these conjectures are true, then the value of this lambda nk fact, of this lambda nk numbers is equal to these numbers which are written here. Uh, so what we can show is, for example, that this constant in for dimension four and surgery dimension one is largely equal to 38.9. And this would be the conjectured value. 
And similarly, in other cases, there are other contracted values. There are still some cases where you only can show positivity without having an explicit value. So this is clearly still a, a, a drawback. Um, but nevertheless, uh, so many of these invariants for which we get lower bounds. And these lower bounds are, are, are pretty strong already. For example, we will see that this has, that if this, um, yeah, but this let's discuss it later, yeah. So, um, so now I want to talk about the smooth DMRP invariant. So what one can do is now, we have these DMRP constants, which are conformal invariants. And now we take the supremum over all conformal classes uh, of the conformal Yamabe constant. So this, this is a number which only depends on M and its differential structure. So it's, a, it's a, an invariant of a smooth manifold. And it takes value from any, the values are any real number which is smaller or equal to the Yamabe constant of the round sphere. For example, the, for example, the sigma, the, Sigma invariant of the round sphere. Obviously, that's just the, the Marbe constant of the round sphere. And maybe I should write here the, the sphere with a, without a double bar because it's just a smooth manifold which goes into it. So that's the smooth Yamabe invariant. And because, because it's defined as a, such a supremo, it's clear that the the Yamabe invariant is positive if and only if M carries a metric of positive scalar curvature. So it's a some kind of refinement of the existence of a positive scalar curvature metric. Uh, now the question is, can you, if you find a metric for which the supremum is attained, can you find Einstein metric? So is it typically an Einstein metric? And there are many few, there are very few cases known for which actually the supremo is attained by an Einstein matrix. And such metrics are called supreme Einstein metrics. So this, is, this goes back to an article by Claude Lebrun. And we say that a Riemann in metric, it's a Riemann, it's a supreme Einstein metric. If at first it's an Einstein metric, so that's one of the conditions we need here. So that doesn't come for free. So if G is a Einstein metric, and if we have equality at both places. So the first equality, that's somehow trivial for an Einstein metric. So every, as, as we have seen, Obata's theorem tells us that for an Einstein metric, we always have equality here, but that's the critical thing. That, that, so that's somehow this supremo is actually attained and it's attained by this great concrete Einstein metric. And examples are, for example, round spheres, and there's it's a, pretty trivial argument. Then another example are also flat manifolds, for example, flat tori, or more generally enlargeable manifolds, which have a, so sorry, of flat manifolds. And then we can use techniques about enlargeable manifolds in order to prove this second equality design. So you have to show that there are no positive scalar culture metrics and therefore, yeah, it follows from Kromf uh enlargeability obstruction, for example. And also there is the, it's known for RP3. And then it goes back to, by an argument by Bray and Naves, where they use Boiskind and Ilmanen's uh, technique, uh, techniques associated to the inverse mean curvature flow. And, um, and also another case is the three-dimensional hyperbolics, uh, three-dimensional hyperbolic spaces. And then one uses the Ritchie flow. So each case we, one proves it very, very, deep techniques go into it. And then also, it's also known for, for many Kähler surfaces and other manifolds in dimension four. And Claude Lebrun will talk about this in the next talk. And there you use saber witten theory and index theory in order to, to show that we have equality in the second slot for the Fubini Studi metric. So, uh, so you can ask, for example, is the Fubini Studi metric on CP3, also a supreme Einstein metric. And I don't think it's true because we have these conjectures about these values of lambda and k. And if the conjectures don't hold, then we have very strange solution of the Yamabe equations. We have very strange metrics of constant scalar curvature. All the conjecture hold. And then this, 
this values of this constant lambda mk, they imply that the Fubini Studi metric on CP3 is not a supreme Einstein metric. Then there are conformal classes where the Amabe constant is larger than the Amabe constant of the Fubini Studi metric. So that's probably true for many, many manifolds. So that's what I wanted to say about supreme Einstein metrics. And now the question is how many manifolds are there with Amabe? constant between zero and lambda and these numbers lambda n. And fortunately, we don't know very much about it. So in principle, it, it could be uh, that it could be, so the following statement, it could be true, but probably it's not true that for all dimensions larger uh, equal to five, the Yamabe invariant is either zero or the Yamabe invariant of the sphere. This could be true, but nobody, but probably it's not true, but nobody can construct a single manifold of dimension at least five for which the Yamabe invariant is known to be not zero or not the value of the sphere. So this shows how difficult it is to say something about this Yamabe invariance. So, but there is a conjecture by Rick Shane, and I think, I don't know anybody who doesn't believe in this conjecture. And it says the following. So if you have a freely acting group of isometries on the round sphere, uh, such that the quotient is a nice manifold, then the conjecture says that then the round metric gives us a supreme Einstein metric on the quotient. So this would apply that we have equality at all the three places, at all the two places here, all the three quantities here are the same. And therefore, if you do the calculations, then it, in this the the scalar curvature of the standard metric on Sn is n, n times n minus one. And here's that the volume of this quotient to the power two to two divided by n. And this then obviously goes to zero if the if the size of the fundamental group uh, of the this group that we factor out goes to infinity. So, but unfortunately, this conjecture is only known for the trivial group and if the manifold is RP3. So but if the conjecture holds, there are plenty of such manifolds. But uh, yeah. So, um, so one conclusion we can do out of this search formula is somehow for for metrics on M, we obtained metrics on M after of M sharp of the, of the manifold after surgery, uh, such that the Amabe constant is almost monotone, and therefore we get a similar statement for the Yamabe invariance. So the Yamabe invariant of, of the manifold after surgery is larger or equal than the Yamabe invariant before surgery, and, and then the minimum together with this constant lambda nk. So now what we do is somehow the interesting part is now uh, this, this part, this, this area between zero and this number capital lambda which is defined as the minimum of this lambda n case. And what we do is we somehow cut off the Yamabe invariant. Uh, so we choose this function chi lambda n. And this function is zero if t is negative. Then in this area, is, uh, chi t is just t. And here after lambda n, we just take the constant function lambda n. And then we compose we compose somehow the sigma, the, the, the Marbe invariant, we put it into this cutoff in this, this function, chi, and this gives a truncation of this the Marbe invariant. And then this result immediately gives that somehow this truncated the Marbe invariant is then monotone under surgery. And if we have then surgery between two and n minus three, then, uh, then we have equality here. So it's in some sense a borders of invariant. And so we can define bordersome results. And what we can do is, is say, assuming that the many dimension is at least five and the, we have a finally presented group, then uh, the, if we combine the standard bordersome techniques used, for example, by Kromov and Lawson and Stolz to, do, to study positive scalar curvature metrics, uh, then our theorem A yields a um, um, special bordersome invariant. And this defined as follows. So we represent a class in, the, in this bordersome groups. So 
So these are bordism. So these are manifolds M together with maps to B gamma up to spin bordisms together with maps to B gamma. Cobordism rather than bordism is what you mean. Bordism W. Cobordism. Co huh? Sorry, what? So these are spin bordisms oh. from one spin manifold to another one. So M should be spin. So did I say something wrong? Um, you mean cobordism rather than bordism, right? So. Okay, cobordism, yeah, yeah. I don't distinguish properly between it. Uh, yeah, okay. So cobordisms between M and M, M prime or M zero and M one. And um, and so, um, so, uh, and so in, in the standard, so what we do is um, we choose the representative in such a way that this map F induces a bijection on the level of the fundamental groups, which can always be, you, there are always such representatives. And then we, we take the value of the truncated Yamabe invariant. And that's now something which is invariant under, under this core bordisms. And therefore uh, we get uh, such a core bordism invariance. And, and then also this surgery properties also means implies that then this new invariant of, of a sum of A and B is largely equal to the minimum of the invariant of A and the invariant of B. And also what is pretty trivial is that if we take the invariant of minus A, that's equivalent to S gamma of A because orientation doesn't influence the Yamabe constant. So, and therefore, if we take all these classes for which the Yamabe invariant is at least lambda, then this is a subgroup of the spin or spin bordism group. And uh, so, uh, so we get, so we probably know this from the case of positive scalar curvature classes, they also form a subgroup. And so we have the same thing for all these lambdas between zero and um, so for all the lambdas in the relevant range from zero to lambda n, we have similar subgroups. But it's not so clear how, how rich these structures are. There's another thing I want to say is, uh, if you look at index theory, then the, typ the typical index, which goes from spin bosom class to KON of C star gamma is typically divided into several pieces. It's decomposed in several maps. And often you see, for example, in Storch's papers, this decomposition of the index map. And you can ask whether this invariant then factors to another invariant here or here. And in fact, you can also show that it already factors on this level by by possibly by, by changing a bit the constant lambda n. And for this, we have to analyze the kernel of this map. And this is done, can be done in a similar way as explained in a recent article by Bernard Hanke, in which he somehow shows that the kernel is essentially given by certain manifolds which are composed by certain HP2 bundles, which, are then, which then give rise to certain bar Sullivan singular manifolds. And by analyzing these manifolds properly, then you can also characterize their Yamabe constants uh, or the Yamabe invariants. And therefore, this, this, this map also passes to this level. So I don't know whether there's any chance to pass it on a further level. But I don't want to say too much about these things. Uh, I also want to say some words about the interpretation. So how much time is still left? Maybe about five minutes, or we start a little bit late. So uh, I also want to say some words about the interpretation of this theorem B, because we have these maps from this first, from this space before surgery and the space after surgery. And all these maps, they are compatible by, by changing the lambda lambda to another lambda. So in fact, we have not just one single map, but we have a, a full family of maps, which are all com compatible with inclusion. So probably the right concept here would be that we don't consider this as one single topological space, but of a, of a filtered topological space. So it's a family of topological spaces together with the inclusion of the larger space. So if I have put a larger constant lambda, a lambda twiddle larger than lambda, 
Then obviously we have an inclusion of the space of metrics with the Amabe constant largely equal to lambda into the corresponding space of met metrics with the Amabe constant largely equal to lambda. And these maps are compatible with this inclusion. So it's somehow a filtered map. And then also in the case that the, the social dimension is at least two, uh, the whole construction can be done in a filtered way. So it's some kind of filtered homotopy equivalence. So the filtration is always preserved with the homotopy equivalence. So that's more or less what we have. And one could even cook out more complicated things out of it. So for example, the Amabe invariant could be viewed as the largest lambda such that this, where this lambda, where this, uh, this space here of metrics where the Amabe const is, is larger than lambda is non-empty. That's a trivial reformulation. And if I would take then, uh, so you can see it as a functor from, from this space here. So these are, the, these are some of the objects are the real numbers and, and we have map uh, if lambda is larger or equal than lambda twiddle. So we get a functor somehow from, yeah, somehow from, from, from the real numbers to these spaces here. And so far, nothing complicated happens, but somehow this allows somehow to, to generalize this. And so one would get then, for example, if uh, we can take higher homotopy groups, and we then also get would get the filtration of, of groups that we associate to the spaces, and all these is filtrated groups, this filtration of these groups are then also invariant under this surgery construction. So, but maybe that's not so, let's skip these things here. But what I meant to say is we expect that these groups are complicated and change if we change the value of lambda on spaces like CP3. Yeah, but there's, yeah. Uh, so, um, so there's, I think there should be about five minutes time left. Maybe the best thing how I could use it is if I say something about the two conjectures. So I skip all this. Uh, so I said before that this for this constant lambda nk, we have certain values for, that we can prove, but we also conjecture better values. And I want to justify why we are so sure that these better values should be true. So the first conjecture is, uh, so all these conjectures are about this the Amabe constants of these products. So let me recall that as n minus k minus one, it's the sphere with the standard round metric of section curvature one. And this other space, that's this, this the space such that the section curvature, it's equal to minus c squared. And if c is equal to zero, then it's just a flat Euclidean rk plus one. And now, it seems that the Amabe constant is monotone in C. The Amabe constant of this product is monotone in C. So in particular, we conjecture that this is bounded from below by the Amabe constant of Euclidean space across the sphere. So why, are we, why do we think this is true? And this has to do with the second conjecture. So the second conjecture is the following thing. You study the Yamabe functional on these spaces here. Now, under in most cases, so if sorry, under good conditions, so if you see, for example, is sufficiently small, then it's easy to show that the inform is actually attained. And, uh, and then the question is, what is the symmetry of a minimizer of the Yamabe functional on such a space? So it's pretty easy to show that the minimizer only depends on two parameters. And for this, I want to open a new page here. Sorry, now there is a new page here. So we have here a product of a sphere, the sphere S n minus k minus one, and hyperbolic space. That's the hyperbolic space of dimension k plus one. And now there are any minimizer here of this the Amabe function of on this product. For any minimizer, there is a 
something like a center of gravity in the hyperbolic space. And there's also a similar special point on a sphere such that the, minima, the minimizer, the minimizer, it's a metric uh, G of the form U to the power four N minus two times the product metric, the standard metric on this product. Uh, and this function U only depends on two parameters R1 and R2. And R1 is the distance to the red point, to the red point on the hyperbolic space. And R2 is the distance to the red point on, on the sphere. That's something which is pretty easy to show that the minimizer has this symmetry. So this means that the minimizer has as a symmetry group, the O n minus k, which is the symmetry group of the round sphere. Uh, sorry, sorry. It's, uh, my, it's uh, sorry, it's minus one that's somehow, because this symmetry is somehow given on the sphere, cross. Uh, you had it right before. Okay. That's the symmetry we have on the, Oh, actually, um, you have to on the sphere, point, right? because we know it depends, because somehow we, we need, need the isometries which fix a point, and mm -hmm. so these are the symmetries with, with fixing these two points. Mm -hmm. So that's the symmetry you have for free, but but if the c is smaller equal to one, it's it's uh, it's very likely that these this the, the dependence on uh, on R two actually doesn't happen. That the functions, the minimizers are constant on R2. Otherwise, we have very strange minimizers. And so what we conjecture is that this, the, the, the minimizers are even constant on the spheres. So they are OK plus one plus O n minus k invariant. And then the, the Yamabe equation, the, this equation that the scalar curvature, this metric G is constant, it then turns into an ODE. And this ODE can be solved numerically. And if you solve this ODE numerically, then you get a first conjecture. So that's somehow the evidence why we are so convinced in these two conjectures. And and with this and with, with this, if these two conjectures are true, for example, then the Fubini the metric is not a supreme met, a supreme metric on CP3. And there are many other such implications. And then the, the values of this lambda and k factors are actually very close to the value of the Marple constant of the sphere. Yeah, and maybe that's a good point to start, uh, to stop for today.